bit of a hiccup, so we apologize. <laughs> I'm Mark Bartlett, the head librarian, and it's really wonderful to uh, have so many members and friends of the library here tonight. Um, this is a special evening, and one that we a few months ago didn't anticipate having, but uh, it's a, a, going to be a wonderful occasion, and I'm going to let Sarah Holiday, my events coordinator, do the introduction, but I just wanted to say a couple of things as head librarian as we're closing our programming season for the summer, and we'll be back uh, in the fall here in the members' room with many more events. I did want to uh, have a round of applause for two people that we often forget to thank here in the library, uh, who are Harry Abarca, our porter, and John McEwen, our um, maintenance supervisor, who really, they pull together so many things that involve moving all of this furniture around and moving in the equipment and really make all of our programs and events possible by uh, providing us seats. So thank you very much to Harry and John. And there are many people in the library who help plan events, but tonight I just want to especially thank Sarah Holliday and Katie Freakas, who are now a, a two-person team uh, planning our, many of our events that happen here in the members' room and have so many special evenings. If you have a cell phone or a pager or a buzzer, if you could just take it out now and silence it uh, for the rest of the program, that would be wonderful. And I will finish with saying uh, you will be getting an issue of the library notes over the next few weeks, which is our newsy newsletter. It's less about events, but more about the news and current things that uh, the library is doing, projects, and some updates from me as head librarian. So please welcome now Sarah Holliday. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, as Mark mentioned, this is our last event of the season, and it's great to see so many people here this far into the summer. It's really terrific. It's clearly a testament to the impact of the subject and of the play of the columnist. The library is planning a big new season of events for the fall, which will be announced right around Labor Day, so watch your uh, print mailbox and your email box. I'm essentially here with a couple of shout-outs. First, our speaker just let me know that she will be publishing an ebook on tonight's topic later this summer with the terrific title, Don't Knock Unless You're Bleeding, Growing Up in Cold War Washington. If you'd like to receive a message when the book is available, you can add your name to the list on the table at the front here. There's a list, a couple of pins there. Um, put your name and email and we'll let you know when you can download that. Secondly, if you have not yet seen the columnist at Manhattan Theater Club's Friedman, Theater, I strongly recommend it. I've been a subscriber to the MTC and lots of other theater companies for many years, and this is really one of the most superb plays I've seen since, well, Proof, also by David Auburn and directed by Daniel Sullivan. <coughs> Ticket information is included in your program. And the play was just extended through July 8th, so you do have a, a kind of second chance to see it. Third, I was delighted the other day to be contacted by David Auburn and his wife, Frances Rosenfeld, who it turns out are members of this library. They're such quiet users, we hadn't even realized. They gave me permission to mention this to tonight's audience and to add their comment, we love the NYSL. It is always exciting to find a distinguished author in our midst. Speaking of which, I met Elizabeth Winthrop as a library patron a few years ago, and I remember how thrilled I was to find out afterward that she's the author of The Castle in the Attic. That book was read and reread by me and all my geeky friends years ago, <laughs> and it influenced many of us toward a love of fantasy, as well as toward good writing in general. Elizabeth won the Dorothy Canfield Fisher Award for that book, one of many honors her work for children and adults has received. Her other books include Counting on Grace, In My Mother's House, and Island Justice, and she's currently at work on a larger family history. You can take a look at a small selection of her work uh, for sale in the Beluso Family Exhibition Gallery, and all proceeds from that sale to go to the library. It's no surprise that Elizabeth's wide range of writings delights so many people. As she mentions on her website, she comes from a family of writers, from her great-great-uncle Theodore Roosevelt, to her father and uncle, distinguished journalists Stewart and Joseph Alsop. We have a beautiful image of them over there, and we'll see some more today. <coughs> Given New Life by David Auburn's play, the Alsop brothers were among the defining voices of the mid-20th century. Elizabeth Winthrop lived through those turbulent years in the center of it all, and we're honored to have her share her, her unique perspective with us. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Mark and Sarah. Um, this is kind of overwhelming. 
I just want to say, first of all, that this is one of my favorite places in the world. This room, this library. Uh, I sit upstairs on the fifth floor, as many people have stood at this podium talk about the fifth floor and what a haven it is for them. And I've been coming here, I now find out, from reading the archives, uh, for quite a few years. I still like 27. Um, <laughs> I think a member of our family goes back to 1754, unbelievably enough. And every, every generation gets to will your share to the next generation. And Uncle Joe willed uh, his share to me. And it was really almost the best inheritance I've ever gotten, except when I sit on the fifth floor and I think about Uncle Joe looking over my shoulder, <laughs> over his glasses, and looking at the sentence I'm writing, which he often did when he was alive. So it's a little bit of a ghostly presence. Um, I'd love a show of hands of people who have not seen The Columnist. Okay, so I'll do a little chat about that. And is there anybody in the room who personally knew <coughs> Joe or my father, Stuart Olson? Terrific. Um, so for those of you who haven't actually seen The Columnist, it could be called The Decline and Fall of Joseph Olson. Uh, briefly, it opens in Moscow in 1957, where my Uncle Joe was entrapped by the KGB um, in bed with a man and photographed. Uh, it moves through him in Washington, D.C. during the Kennedy inauguration, the height of his fame his marriage, his stepchildren, his relationship with my father, his writing partner for many years, and his lonely life after JFK was killed and his marriage broke up and my father died. Um, so you can imagine this play opened in April 3rd and ever since then I have heard the question, what did you think of the play? Even the doormen are beginning to ask. <laughs> And one fellow in our library, in our lobby, said to me, "I hear you're on Broadway." I said, "Well, not exactly." <laughs> so um, I've had to really think about what I think of the play, and I come at this from two different angles, which isn't true for all the members of my family. I come at it as a daughter and a niece, and I come at it as a writer. <coughs> so. About 18 months ago, I found out through wonderful Google Alerts that uh, David Auburn was writing a play about my Uncle Joe and my father. And we're, by doing a little snooping around, as often happens in New York City, I discovered Mr. Auburn lives on my block <laughs> at the very end of the street. And so I typed him a letter. And I walked down, and I left it with his doorman with a copy of my book, Counting on Grace, that includes a historical figure. And I basically said, if you want to talk to Joseph Alsop's niece, I was very close to him, and if you'd like some family input, great. If not, I understand, we'll never know who each other are. <laughs> he did, after a week, contact me, and we went out to a local coffee shop for a uh, um, cup of tea, and he asked a lot of questions. He is a very gentle man. He is 42, I think. He is, um, he, he really knew how to draw things out of me. So he said, you know, what does your uncle look like? What did he sound like? And so for his sake, I did my great imitation of Uncle Joe, and I said his favorite three words were, in this voice, God damn it, Stu! <laughs> Everybody in the coffee shop looked a little surprised. Um, that's what he called Daddy. Daddy's nickname was Stu. So we communicated, and then he said, you know, do you want to read the play? And I said, well, maybe. So about six months later, when he had finished it, he sent me a copy of the play. And it was attached to an email. And the email notice said, I just want you to know that I haven't made any of these choices lightly. But for example, I killed your father in 1968, and he died in 74. So I wrote him back, and I said, Dave, we were now on first name basis, I hope you haven't been holding your breath down there at the end of the block waiting for my response to your play. I haven't read the script, 
and have, after much thought, decided not to. I think I would get unnecessarily upset with the rewriting of my family history. I'm not sure why it matters to me, for example, that my fa that father actually died in 1974 and not in 1968, but there it is. I realize and appreciate you have not made these choices lightly, and as I've said before, I'm a writer first and a daughter niece second. But I've come to the conclusion that not reading the play is the best way to keep those priorities straight. And that's how we left it. Except I was lying. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, looking back, my priorities had switched. Suddenly I was a daughter and a niece first. And I kept thinking, how can you change a man's death date and not his name? That bugged me. And then, why did I care so much? Well, most of the characters in this play are dead. They involve my Uncle Joe, my Aunt Susan Mary, um, my cousins, Ann and Bill, who have been pushed together into a composite character called Abigail, David Halberstam, who is dead, my mother is mentioned off stage. Um, but we also are a very large and very loyal tribe. And I did not want Mr. Auburn's idea about my father and my uncle to become the received history of the Alsop brothers. There wasn't a lot I could do about it, but I just, it began to get to me. And I finally, the funny thing is, you know, I know that in drama you have to select and focus and limit. I'm a writer, I'm a fictional, you know, I'm a writer of fiction. I'm very close to a playwright. I know about that. But as a child and a niece, it began to really rankle. And the other piece of this was that I kind of felt like I was losing my story. Now, on April 28th, 92 members of our family and friends came to see this play. <laughs> and uh, we had a lot of discussions, as you can imagine, about what we're going this or that. But there are only a couple of people in our family who are writers. One of them, actually, my nephew, is here tonight. He is Joseph Wright, also the seventh. Um, he's a writer, I'm a writer, I have a cousin who's a writer, but most of us didn't really come at it as writers. They came at it as family members. And so I thought, wait a minute, this is a story I want to tell. So I was prompted to write this memoir, Don't Knock Unless You're Bleeding. And I'm just going to read you a little section so you can see why I call it that. In 1958, when Daddy accepted the position of Washington editor for the Saturday Evening Post and left the partnership with my uncle, he moved his office into our house. We understood that he was not to be disturbed. Now, I have five brothers, you have to keep going. In the middle of a typical afternoon when a group of us might be playing Monopoly on the front hall floor, Daddy's study door would suddenly burst open. We'd freeze and look up without speaking. He'd step across our bodies, stride into the living room past my mother on the phone, circle the couch, circle the couch again, take the piece of gum that he used to cut down on his cigarette habit and roll it around between his finger and thumb, retrace his steps, step over us, pop the gray wad back into his mouth, and with a slam of the door, disappear again into the office. Like a ghost, he materialized in our midst and then melted away through the wall. Even though my father, unlike most, was physically present during the workday, he was mentally and emotionally absent. For all the notice he took of us, he might as well have been on one of his trips abroad. I used to tell people there was a sign on his office door that read, please don't knock unless you're bleeding. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a quick tour of the Alsop family by an Alsop, and uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the play, and then we'll have questions. Uncle Joe was born in 1910. That's Daddy and Uncle Joe. He was uh, one of four. My um, so that's my auntie on the right, my father, looking terrified. <laughs> my Uncle John, so my father was born in 1914, my Uncle John was born in 1915. As you can see, Uncle Joe already has a kind of paternal avuncular attitude. <laughs> uh, this is the tribe thing, and it started back then. 
Their father, Joseph Alsop IV, was a Darien tobacco farmer, and he became an insurance man. He was a Republican prominent in Connecticut state politics. Their mother, Corinne Robinson Alsop, was Theodore Roosevelt's niece, Eleanor Roosevelt's first cousin, and one of the first women in the Connecticut state legislature. Joe went off to Groton and Harvard. Stewart went to Groton and Yale. When Uncle Joe was at Harvard, he would come down to Groton, where my father was always in trouble. He was either flunking out or deciding to be baptized as a Baptist, which alarmed my, my grandparents, or disappearing or something. And Uncle Joe would take it upon himself to come down from Harvard and take care of the problem. And he spoke to Endicott Peabody, who was the head of Groton, the way he later spoke to Lyndon Johnson as if he was entirely right and he knew exactly what should be done about poor Stewart. So there was that avuncular attitude from the very beginning. He graduated from Harvard in 1932, and he moved to, New to Washington to work for the Herald Tribune. Now, his first reporting where he was really noticed was on the, was on the trial of Bruno Hauptmann, um, the Lindbergh, uh, kidnapped Lindbergh baby. He rose quite quickly and he became a syndicated partner. He became a partner in a syndicated column which they wrote daily with a man named Robert Kintner. FDR was in the White House. Cousin Eleanor gave him scrambled eggs. FDR poured martinis. He got to meet a lot of people in Washington and he did very well. He quit, of course, when the war came, and both of them, Kintner and Uncle Joe, both joined the Army. That, Uncle Joe joined the Navy, actually and went to work for Claire Chenault in China, the Flying Tigers. He had the misfortune of being caught in Hong Kong when the Japanese invaded, and he had a flight out on the last airplane, and it was taken away from him and given to Madame Chiang Kai-shek's dog. So, <laughs> Uncle Joe ended up in a very tough internment camp. He had had the smarts to sew various jewels into his, typical Uncle Joe, into his seams, which he used to bribe the guards. So he kept himself alive and a number of other people. He was exchanged as a prisoner in July of 1942. He came back to the States, immediately re-enlisted and went back to work for Shimon. He spent the rest of the war in China. My father had high blood pressure and asthma and was turned down by the army repeatedly. He finally enlisted in the British Army and he became a member of a regiment called the King's Royal Rifle Corps. He um, trained in a place called Winchester in York, and on August 31st, 1942, he met my mother. Uh, she was 16, he was 28. And this the day they met is the exact same day that her only brother was killed in Libya in the Western Desert, which is quite amazing. Um, so that's why I'm writing a book called My Parents' Love Affair, an unlikely romance in wartime England. My father went to fight in the Italian campaign. He came back through Africa. He ended up working for the OSS and jumping behind enemy lines into France. He convinced my British grandparents to allow him to marry my mother on June 20th, 1944, in the middle of a B-1 attack. So, after the war, they all come back to Washington. And Uncle Joe says to Daddy, come on, let's put a column together. You can be, I'll, I'll show you the ropes. And my father wrote really brilliant letters from the war, which are really helping me in the book I'm writing. And uh, so, and, and anybody later in life who said, how do you get to be a journalist? Daddy always said, have an older brother who is one. <laughs> so they got a column together called Matter of Fact. From 1946 to 1958, they wrote three columns a week. It was an incredibly intense writing schedule. They also did long articles for the Saturday Evening Post, Atlantic Monthly. They wrote books like The Reporter's Trade, The Center, From the Silent Earth. And six months, one or the other of them reported from abroad. They never, ever called themselves columnists, ever. That was a bad word for them. They called themselves reporters. In 1984, there was an interview with my Uncle Joe, and they, uh, Brian Lamb on C-SPAN said to him, how do you describe yourself? He said, a hardworking reporter and a self-taught scholar. He was a really very good art historian, too. So that's sort of what they thought of themselves, shoe leather. 
1957, in the middle of their partnership, Uncle Joe was entrapped by the KGB. Um, he went immediately to Charles Bolin, who was the ambassador to Moscow, the American ambassador to Moscow. He was spirited out of Russia uh, to Paris and told to go report to the CIA. He went to see his old friend Frank Wisner, and Frank Wisner said, I want a confession from you. I want everything the KGB could get on you, and I want you to put it down. He did it, apparently. That document ended up on J. Edgar Hoover's desk. So Uncle Joe then became, um, could have become a victim of either the Soviet Union or unscrupulous people in his own government who were not happy about what he said. He never changed what he thought. He never changed what he wrote. Um, life went on as usual, I thought. You know, I was nine at the time. But Uncle Joe was not an easy man to live with or work with. He always held my father to 45%. It was that older brother, younger brother thing. Daddy broke just as many stories. He had an equal, by the time, by 57, he certainly had an equal reputation as a writer. And so the letters between them, which you can read in a book called Taking on the World, which is here and is also for sale online, um, they became increasingly acid. And I have a feeling that that is where David Auburn got his dialogue, is from those letters. Um, and anyway, in 1958, Daddy got a job as the Washington editor of the Saturday Evening Post. Now, what I saw between the two of them were not acid exchanges. They, were, they had enormous loyalty and love for each other. They were immensely amused by one another. They were the first to check in with the other on a subject for a column or a news story or a source. Is that going crazy? Um, and this is, you know, just when the partnership was going strong, and it, the people took a lot of pictures of them. This is Cecil Beaton, and it's really a brilliant picture on, you know, many levels. Look at the V between them and the V down below, and this really captures them. I love this picture. I have no rights to publish it anywhere, but I can show it to you. Um, and that takes me to really the hardest thing for me as a daughter and a niece in terms of the play. Anybody who's seen the play knows that in every stage, Uncle Joe is just hammering on Daddy. You know, he puts down the Saturday Evening Post. He's vitriolic about Daddy's writing and throw that paragraph away. He's, you know, he, he, he's, just, he's just on him all the time. That was not the way it was. And that is very hard for me to see because they had this incredible loyalty to one another and Uncle Joe had just as much respect for Daddy's writing. In the play, Mr. Auburn, as he promised, kills my father off in 68, and he has him not speak to Uncle Joe about how sick he is. Now, when Daddy got sick in 71, he was given six weeks to live originally. He lived almost three years. And he uh, called each of his six children, and of course, Mommy knew because she was in the hospital with him, and the first person after that was Joe. And the first thing Joe said is, what can I do? and he gave Daddy platelets for a year. Now, to give platelets is not an easy thing in those days. You lay on the table, they took the blood out of you, they put it through a centrifuge, they pulled all the platelets out, they threw them in Daddy, and they put the blood back into Uncle Joe, what was left of it. And it's an exhausting, long-term process, and he did it once a week, until they found a better match. We used to tell Uncle Joe it wasn't that they found a better match, they found blood with a little less alcohol in it. <laughs> Um, the whole part of Uncle Joe that Mr. Auburn rightfully uh, focuses on is his Vietnam stance. He backed himself in a corner with Vietnam. He did get very, very rigid about it. Daddy was the more, you know, balanced person at that point. At one point, Uncle Joe said, this war cost me my reputation, my happiness, and my figure. Um, by that time, definitely, in the mid-60s, my father was the also who people were reading because he was more moderated. My brother Joe said to me yesterday, he said, you know, when you started a column by Uncle Joe, you always knew where it was going to go. When you started a column by Daddy, you're never quite sure where it was going to go. He would surprise you. Um, the other thing he did was he, was he was the back page of Newsweek for six years. It was a coveted position. It was very, he was read by a lot of people. And finally, he wrote a book called Stay of Execution 
which is one of the first memoirs ever about what it feels like to be told you're going to die sooner than you thought you were. Um, and it's a book that still is referenced by doctors and hospitals all over the world. Um, now, Uncle Joe was our second father. He was a bachelor until 1961, and our parents fed and sheltered us, but Uncle Joe civilized us. <laughs> so this comes from the same memoir piece. Where Daddy might glance at us with the distracted air of a man who's briefly forgotten he has any children, Uncle Joe, when he had us in his sight, focused on nothing else. Every Thursday evening, my mother delivered me and my two older brothers dressed in our Sunday best to Uncle Joe's house for our only proper dinner of the week. We ate early so Uncle Joe could supervise us. He joined us at the formal dining room table, drink in hand, dressed for his own evening out. Oblivious to the dangers secondhand smoke might pose to our young lungs, he lit one Benson and Hedges after another. We always had the same menu. Steak and gravy, mashed potatoes, peas, and French vanilla ice cream with chocolate sauce, the kind that turns hard the moment it hits the ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Joe's Filipino butler, Jose, served us. His wife, Maria, did the cooking. We learned to spread our napkins across our laps, turn to the left so we could lift, lift a piece of steak from the platter and set our forks down between bites. Uncle Joe corrected our posture, asked questions about school, and at the end of the meal, he doled out money, depending on our marks. You got $10 for an A, $5 for a B. He absolutely, categorically, refused to pay for any course called social studies. <laughs> what is that, he would roar. I never heard of such a thing. You study history, you study geography, you do figures. Social studies, what nonsense. <laughs> the gloomy eyes of our New England ancestors bored into our backs from their places on the wall. Bill the parrot squawked from a neighboring room, and Uncle Joe smiled with amusement as he entertained Stuart's young. So this is the man who intrigued David Auburn so much that he decided to write an entire play about him. What is true and what is not in The Colonist? Uncle Joe in bed in Moscow with a Soviet agent. After that, Daddy did all the reporting from the Soviet Union. Uncle Joe never went back. And he used to tell me he hated, he hated Moscow, Daddy did. It was so gray. He said everything was gray. The people, the faces, the clothes, the, the rooms. But he said you always went into a room and you went under all the frames, you went all the way around the pictures, behind the mirrors, because you knew it was bugged. You were just trying to find out exactly where the bug was. Um, the dispersal of the photographs to other journalists that's in the play. The KGB began to send the photographs around in 1970, ironically, 13 years afterwards. They went to Art Bookwald. Art Bookwald wrote a play that ran on Broadway for 105 um, performances called Sheep on the Runway. He called his main character Joe Mayflower. It was definitely Uncle Joe. And Uncle Joe was not, did not welcome Art Bookwald ever into his house again, nor did he allow anybody he knew to welcome Art Bookwald into his house. So uh, the KGB sent, we think it was the KGB, we're not actually sure, sent Bookwald the photographs. Uh, another friend named Charlie Bartlett got them. As far as I know, Mr. Halberstam never got them. Uncle Joe's refusal to cave to the KGB is true, and Mr. Auburn makes that clear. You know, John Lithgow, who's amazing and who inhabits and is embedded in my uncle somehow, uh, he said to me, no matter what your family thinks of my portrayal of your uncle, he said, he is a hero to me. And that, that I think is wonderful. The fights with Halberstam, definitely true, all conducted by letter. Um, Scotty Reston is a phone call with Scotty Reston, obviously had to make it a phone call, you know, it was done by letter. Um, I don't think my father ever met Halberstam. I certainly never met him in Vietnam. Um, the scene where Uncle Joe meets Andre again on the park bench at the end, I think completely false and invented. Fine, you know, fiction writers do that. That's fine. I have a cousin who says, I don't know, Elizabeth's kind of la la land. Could have happened. I, I don't know. The relationship with his stepdaughter Abigail, which really humanizes Uncle Joe and play, that's pretty funny. 
My cousin Anne met with Mr. Auburn, and I think she gave him the best line in the play. Um, at one point, Abigail, who was played by Grace Gummer, who's very good, comes out onto the stage wearing this kind of hippie fringed skirt. And Uncle Joe looks at her and says, good God, you look like Pocahontas. <laughs> <laughs> totally true. Came right out. <laughs> There's a scene where my father is there at the assassination of Kennedy, um, and, and he says, I have to go home and take the children to the mall. Well, that's hysterical. First of all, my, my father wouldn't take us to people's drugstore if he could avoid it. He was a definitely part, in, in a certain way, of children are to be seen and not heard. Secondly, me and my brothers were all in boarding school in 1963. Um, and also, I don't think people really took their children to the National Mall. That's kind of a post-9-11, be more involved with your kids, get them to know current events stuff. No, no, no. We all just sat around watching television, basically. The sets, the study, brilliant. The hotel bedroom in Moscow, I'm sure, many opulent hotel bedrooms. Even the cemetery with the wall that you know, makes you think of the Vietnam Memorial. The first uh, version we saw at the preview, there were no gravestones in the back, so I thought the wall was weird as weird, but never mind, it, it works. But Uncle Joe's living room, oh my lord. Okay, so it's kind of a 50s suburban house set. That's what it looks like. And at one point, Uncle Joe says, don't put your feet on that brilliant coffee table I just got at the antique shop. Well, if you look at the coffee table, it came out of, you know, Housing Works on 3rd <laughs> Avenue. It's clearly repro. Uncle Joe would not let that coffee table in his house. I mean, his, it's his living room. <laughs> it was an amazing living room. From my memoir, Uncle Joe had spent World War II in China. In his living room, most of the priceless objects that graced every table came from Asia. Shiny lacquered boxes, blue and white porcelain jars, small greenish bronze figurines, and netsukis, those carved ivory and wooden oriental animals. When we first arrived for our Thursday night dinners on Dumbarton Avenue, my mother suggested Uncle Joe remove the priceless artifacts while we children were visiting. He always refused. They will learn not to break them, they announced. She watched with trepidation as we spread through the room like predators on the prowl. After all, we constantly broke things in our own house. But he was right. We didn't touch, or if we did, we handled his precious objects with great care. Nothing was ever broken. Auburn writes in the second scene of the second scene of the first act. Uncle Joe's house the night of Kennedy's inauguration. As a fiction writer, playwright, smartly, he brings everybody together. Susan Mary is there, his new wife. Uh, Abigail appears, the 14-year-old, and my father. None of us were there. It doesn't matter. That's not important. The funny thing was that after the, you know, there was a big party before the inauguration balls, and my uncle had 25 people for dinner, and mommy and dad were there. And then they went all went off to the balls, and then Jackie went to the White House to go to sleep, and JFK wandered around to the other balls, and Uncle Joe just left all his lights on. So that told everybody, okay, there's a party at Joe's house. So they started to show up spontaneously. Now, Aunt Susan Mary was not yet married to Uncle Joe, and she was still in Paris. So three days after the inauguration, he writes her this report. To complicate matters further, there were no eggs. Everyone was hungry, and there was nothing left to do but heat up the terrapin I had ordered at the dinner this week for you and the president. I was rather desperately heating terrapin, thinking terrapin, thinking bitterly the while how dreadfully expensive my galloping hospitality was proving when there was a loud <clears throat> knock at the door. Wearily cursing myself for my folly, I left the terrapin and opened the door. There, large as life on the doorstep, was JFK, who had been told about my unintentional party by some friends. Hi, Joe, mind if I come in, was his remark. Rather naturally, I said I didn't mind. I think he really came, Susan Mary, because he was hungry. You know, you can imagine, new house, wife gone to bed, where's the icebox? <laughs> The only other thing about the play that's really hard for me is the relationship with Susan Mary. It's just not who she was. Um, they were married uh, about a month after Kennedy's inauguration. 
Susan Mary was the daughter of a diplomat. She married a diplomat. She lived in Paris from 1945 to 1960. In those days, the women who were seen about town were dressed by the great designers, Longvin, Belmain, Balenciaga. And Susan Mary was one seen about town. So she arrived in Washington with these first closet that Uncle Joe had built for her. It was double height, and it had motorized curtains. You could push a button and swish. You know, and there were all these amazing dresses that nobody had ever seen anything like it in Washington before. She was very chic. Uh, here we are at my coming out party, my debutante party, um, with Mrs. Longworth, Alice Roosevelt Longworth, who gave the dinner before my party, and Aunt Susan Mary and something by the long band or something, and Uncle Joe and Daddy. So she, she was not only beautifully dressed, and unfortunately Margaret Collin, who plays her, I think looks like a Chevy Chase frumpy housewife, she would, Aunt Susan Mary would rise from her grave if she could see some of those outfits. I did send some pictures to the uh, to Auburn, and he sent them on. I think they actually got her into patent leather heels, which helped a lot. But there's some purple moo moo that she would never be seen dead in. But the other part of it is, in the play, she's a kind of supplicating, oh, gee, Joe, could we just go on a little trip to Europe together? Well, alone. Susan Mary had a cutting wit. She had an intellect that was terrifying. She was completely, incredibly well-read. And she argued with him. And that was the part that he didn't like. By 1968, the Tet Offensive, she was against the war. And she told him exactly what she thought. And he would, at his most irritated or irritable, would say, God damn it, Susan Mary, you sound like a New York Times editorial. <laughs> he used to, at one point, he quote, was quoted as saying the New York Times was a lunatic cathedral. <laughs> but after the divorce, I mean, again, this is all fiction, nonfiction, but after the divorce, they remained excellent friends. They had each other for dinner all the time. They both came to our house for dinner. They talked to each other on the phone almost daily. They compared gossip. And in the afternoon, they would take a little walk together around Georgetown. So she was just so much more interesting character. And finally, my father died in 1974, not in 68. Um, it's not the date that matters so much. It's that who he really was, the full kind of uh, amazing writer that he was, and the level where he was equal to Uncle Joe just doesn't come through in the play. You know, Auburn knows how to develop character. He developed the character of Joe very well by bringing in Abigail, who softens him. It shows the part that we played in his life. Stuart's young. Um, I found the first scene in Moscow with the man in bed incredibly moving. Um, I think Uncle Joe is a very lonely man in a lot of ways, and I thought that was beautifully done. Um, and obviously, that was not a video camera. It was a still camera, so that was totally imagined by Mr. Auburn. So I think he got the essence of Joe in certain ways, and I think Lithgow really, inhabit, as I said, inhabits him. He didn't get both. I met both John Lithgow and Boyd Gaines before the play opened, and they were wonderful. They, they, I think Boyd does an amazing job with what he's given. And at one point he wrote me and he said, I'd send him a lot of videotapes of Daddy, and he said, you know, I'm caught between two masters. Sort of what I see and what's on the page. And, and I think Mr. Auburn wanted Joe to be so big in the play that everybody surrounding becomes a lesser character. As I said, the title, The Columnist, is really ironic for me. Um, it's my father at the Democratic Convention, I think, in 60. And, you know, they were reporters. They did not sit behind that telephone. They were out <coughs> all the time. Daddy would find the most obscure people in the smallest government agency in order to get a new quirk or to get something explained to him. Um, he was embedded with the Ku Klux Klan once. He, they um, created the words domino theory, um, egghead, uh, eyeball to eyeball, which was in an article my father wrote about the um, the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. So, and they had no internet. You could not sit there and hit Google, you know, and type in something. They had to find it all themselves. So, in conclusion, I'd say Uncle Joe in an interview in 1984 said, they've even taken to writing plays about wasps as if we are a vanished tribe. <laughs> <laughs> Little did we know. 
So only really the family and close friends uh, care about how the play deviates from real life. And as a niece and a daughter, as you can tell, I'm itching to set the historical record straight. And as a writer of fiction, my other hat, I honor many of Mr. Auburn's choices. He used fiction to try to get to the truth of one very interesting, very complex man. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, fiction reveals truth that reality obscures. And that's certainly been my credo as a fiction writer. But this play is a peculiar hybrid. It's a mixture of fact and fiction. It's, I call it faction. <laughs> so I wonder what the play would have been like if Mr. Auburn had changed the names. It took me back to my first reaction when Dave said, you know, killed your father off early, why didn't he change his name? Stuart Alton, whatever. Then I thought, what if he had completely fictionalized? And I, you know what I thought of was Inherit the Wind. Inherit the Wind was written in 1955 at the height of the McCarthy Hueck hearings, right? Now, the two playwrights, Lawrence and Lee, decided to write about the Scopes trial. Now, to refresh our memory, in 1925, Mr. Scopes was brought up on trial for breaking the law for teaching evolution in a high school. And everybody descended on this Tennessee trial. And the Bible thumping prosecutor was William Jennings Bryan. In the play, he's called Matthew Harrison Brady. I mean, he gives him three names, right? Uh, Clarence Darrow is called Henry Drummond. By, by doing this, the writers are signaling to the audience, we're going to serve drama first and history second. And we might actually get to truth by doing that. So I just kept thinking, you know, and the people who saw that play in 1955, of course they thought of the Scopes trial, but they also thought about what was happening right then with McCarthy and the House on American Activities, anti-communism, anti-intellectualism, etc. And the play endures to this day. I saw it two years ago in Vermont. What if Mr. Auburn had unhooked himself from the portrait of a real figure if he had written a play based on two journalist brothers? Could have called them the Aesops. <laughs> <laughs> he might have broadened the focus so the audience would be less interested in the lives and personalities of the now long forgotten Alsa brothers and more engaged by the themes that he had in the play. What would it be like to be a gay man outed by, by your own government or by the Soviet Union in the 50s and 60s? Um, what about the tight and often unhealthy connections between reporters and their sources? Uncle Joe got definitely too close to Westmoreland and too close to Robert McNamara, etc. And what about the pros and cons of reporting then? where people like my father and my uncle were gatekeepers and wouldn't have done a story on the death panels, right? And now, where you have a much more open and a lot more voices, but you've also got talk radio, and you've also got internet-driven news, and the 24-7 news cycle. That, those are the interesting things, I think. And I think the columnist, written as it is, leaves us wondering too much about who these specific people were. What happened to them? and too little about the larger picture, which is, what does it all mean for us today, a home, you know, this many years later? Anyway, so that's my long answer to a very short question. What did you think? <laughs> Thank you. I talk about the fact that we knew Uncle Joe was different. Um, he cared desperately about his clothes, and you know there were a whole lot of things that. I, uh, somebody said how in this picture over there, the, the Bachrock picture, 
how Uncle Joe, you know, has a tie clip, etc. And I said to Sarah, well, probably, he said to Daddy, all right, I'll lend you a tie, and if, for God's sake, get that suit pressed before they come to take the picture. He, you know, I did not know what the word gay meant, the word homosexual not brought up to me as a child, we were children, we were seen and not heard, so no, I did not know. I really didn't know until the late 80s. And it's interesting because I asked my Uncle John once, did you know that Uncle Joe was gay? And he said, well, I always thought he was sort of a eunuch. He did not know about Uncle Joe's sexual life. My father had to deal with a lot more of that being his partner, because it was not just one incident. And uh, so that, you know, made it a cloud over their heads and they worry, particularly because Uncle Joe occasionally, more often than not, drank too much. So, I wasn't aware of it in that specific terms. Yeah. Could I ask, just as an aside, uh, whatever happened to your Uncle John, who I knew somewhat in uh, that area? Uncle John was wonderful. Uh, so he Daddy, was fantastic. Fantastic guy. guy. Uh, Daddy died in 74. Uncle Joe died in 89. Um, Uncle John uh, lived in Avon, Connecticut. He was an insurance executive. And he took over my grandfather's company. So my grandfather was a shaved tobacco farmer. That meant that, you know, you've seen those. Yeah. That you've seen pictures of them in the Avon area. Well, he found that nobody would insure them against hail. And one hailstorm destroyed an entire year's tobacco crop. This was cigar rolling tobacco. And so he started a company to insure, to self-insure the farmers. And Uncle John took it over. And it became the Covenant Group. So he was an insurance executive till the end of his life. We were very close to him. And he died in probably... 2002 or three, um, ended up living in Old Lyme, Connecticut. Very funny character, and my, my children adored him. I went to Miss Porter's school, and he lived in Farmington, so when they asked my father to give the graduation speech from Miss Porter's dad, he said, no, no, I can't start doing that. I do it for one of you, I have to do it for all of you. So <laughs> Uncle John ended up giving the speech. <laughs> I loved him, yes. Well, I was a young editorial writer at the Washington Post, during that period, and I knew both your father and uncle. Great. I want to say first about your father. Uh, I think it was worth adding, it was his brilliant piece on the Cuban Missile Crisis that introduced the concept of hawk and dove, You're which is now right. used everywhere. Yes, and, and with also, Vietnam. Also, I used to read him regularly in the Newsweek, yeah. and he, if I may say so, was more sensible about Vietnam. And he said something quite brilliant, that he was talking about this, relation between student protests and the selective service. And he said that if you did away with selective service, you would do away with the protests, because it was, this, it was the draft which inflicted on the students everywhere that made it a much more active part of their lives, and he was correct. Totally correct. That's One final thing. Uh, about your uncle, uh, we had a common interest in archaeology. Yeah. He was passionate on the subject. And I got to know him, and he was a great help to a lot of young reporters, uh, but also to me, uh, because we shared that one strange interest. Tell me your name. Carl Meyer. Oh, yeah. yeah. I did also I, uh, an anthology on newspaper columns, if I may oh, use the did? word, called Pundits, Poets, and Wits, in which uh, uh, I have Joe. I don't think I have your father. Oh, that's great. And you know, the funny thing was, Uncle Joe wrote a book. Oh, called... yes, I have one other anecdote. Yeah. <laughs> I was a New York correspondent for a period uh, uh, for the Washington Post, and I got a frantic call from Ben Bradley. Yeah. He said, Carl, we got a problem. Art Buckle's written a play. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sheep on the runway. Sheep on the runway. And Joe is furious about it, and he's had the top loyal lawyer, lawyer in New York sitting under her purse. Can you write a piece about it? Oh, <laughs> what did you do? Well, I tell you, when I, I saw the play, and I did write a piece about it, and I kind of skirted between, I knew both Buckwold and Alice, and I didn't right. want to do it. And I, I maintained my friendship with both, but it was much ado about nothing. It was it a very totally funny play, and, yeah. and, and Jill did not have a sense of humor about it. No, he had no <laughs> sense of humor about himself. And he, uh, he was called Joe Mayflower, and the he, he goes to visit an ambassador in the little country of Nanamura in the Himalayas, and the ambassador is freaking out because he has no linen sheets 
to provide Uncle Joe with. So it's a pretty funny play. 105 performances at the Helen Hayes Theater. And then he's advised by uh, his own uh, ministers. If you want to get Joe Mayflower interested, you've got to have a communist movement. If you don't have a communist movement, it's <laughs> been <laughs> See, that's what I mean about changing the name. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Uh, earlier you were saying that uh, Joe thought that his son-in-law, George Crowell, was an upstart. I think that's what right. you used. Yeah. And I was wondering, did you mean, or did Joe mean, uh, socially, or that intellectually he wasn't up to the level that he thought and to have married and Joe should have been? No, I probably used the wrong word. I think he kind of threw him in the same boat with, in a certain way, with she and, and you know, the younger reporters. And in the play, that's a good point when, when Daddy says in the play, you know, these were who we were, Joe. You know, come on, these guys, they're doing, they're really working hard, they're doing the hard work. I don't think I meant upstart in the, uh, I just think he was young, and he should learn at the feet of the master. That said, Anne was 18 when Uncle Joe, um, this is quite funny, when Uncle Joe pushed George into her arms. I mean, they were dating, and basically he was terrified George was going to get away. He thought, oh my God, Anne will find someone you know, even worse. So he, he had the, they had the wedding, Uncle Joe's incredible house and Uncle Joe hung grapefruits in the in the magnolia trees which was a bit odd. And somebody said to Ann later, you know, the whole war would have ended if someone had just bombed the garden because the entire cabinet was there. Which was true. Um, he he you know he argued a lot with Uncle Joe, I mean with George, and George had a lot of respect for both he had more respect for my father because my father was more of a listener, you know, as Carl was saying. But um, he kind of was glad that, that uh, Anne had ended up with a reporter, which is what, what happened. George Crowell um, worked for, he wrote uh, Charlie Wilson's War in the end of his life. He sadly died of pancreatic cancer. Yes. He's also, I knew George and Anne, and yeah. I knew George at CBS. You should mention that he was involved in the Westmoreland. Yeah, Detroit that's what Roger was talking about. The, yeah, he was, in, he was involved with the story in which the CBS basically said that Westmoreland had been inventing the body counts. And, you know, well, this many, you know, North Vietnamese are killed. And uh, Westmoreland sued CBS. And the trial went on, and George and Anne were there you know, day after day. I honestly can't remember. I think it was settled out of court. I think that's how it ended. But, it, you know, Uncle Joe just... They just didn't talk about that at that point. I think it was, he didn't want to lose Anne. So he, he was careful in his interactions around that issue. Um, any other questions? Yes, sir. You grew up in Washington. Washington is very central, the culture of Washington is very central to the entire family story. You're not in Washington now. Is it because the culture has changed or just because New York had I fled. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, Daddy would be interviewing whoever, and the only one that ever impressed me was John Glenn. Mm -hmm. But you know, McNamara and Kennedy and blah blah blah. There was, and and he, his good friend was my godfather, Tom Brayton, who wrote Eight Is Enough, who was a reporter, and he always was sort of coming to Daddy for advice. And my biggest memory is the living room door springing open, and Tom Brayton would come in and he'd say, "Stu, do your." Life. Blah, blah, blah. And whatever it was, you know, it was, you know, some committee had done something or whatever. Whatever it was, it was a drama. And the next day, there was another drama. And I just thought that I, I won't write fiction. This is insane. You know, I mean, there's no way that I can get on top of these people. I'm going to have to leave. So I just fled. I couldn't get out of, out of Washington fast enough. Ironically, my mother still lives in Washington. My daughter lives in Washington, and her husband is in the State Department. <laughs> so somehow it skipped my generation. Thank you so Great. much. Great. Thank you. I just urge you to, if you want to buy a book, remember all the money goes to the library.